one of the you know most successful things for the continuation of racism and the adaptation of racism is that we've some we somehow have this idea that racism is is conscious bias from mean people how can we talk about racism if it's only mean people who are racists i've met racism since maybe first grade meeting your white neighbors and realizing that you're not wanted and i was called a nigger and a and a coon and all those names that you'd expect to be called when you living back in the 60s and 70s it makes you feel almost dirty in a way i thought maybe it's better to be white maybe i'll be more accepted in society get more friends and whatever they look at me and say well this is really weird and we actually think you're a prostitute so we are denying entrance and you can't and then it says this word you will never enter my country again i don't know i felt like it just wasn't I just didn't deserve that at all. It makes you feel non-human when you get that alienated. After bara några dagar i den nya så tänk det första jag tänker på liksom alla ser så annorlunda ut här. Och sen så tog det några dagar till och sen så förstod jag vänta nu det är jag som ser annorlunda ut här. So as a youngster I used to think life's going to be tough because when I want to go and get a job I know it's going to be harder for me than it is. Is for everybody else. I remember when I first, when I met the first other black kid, and when I saw him and he saw me, it kind of clicked. Like the whole like the whole neighborhood just stopped, and we found each other. Like, wow, you look like me and I look like you, but we don't look like anybody else. We talk like them. We have the same dialect as them. We talk about exactly the same things. We listen to the same music. But that is the only thing that differentiates them from me. And I want to be like them. Jag vill vara som alla andra. We can relate it to, you know, this idea of double consciousness as well, which Dubois talks about, which is when you grow up ethnic minority, you constantly have that double consciousness. You look at yourself through the eyes of the majority white population, and you will judge yourself through the eyes of the majority white population. Och sen så börjar jag tro dem. Och så börjar min självbild förändras. Allt från att när jag, när jag såg en, liksom en, en gammal dam gå över gatan så var jag tvungen att hjälpa till. För att, inte för att jag alla gånger ville hjälpa den här gamla tanten över, över gatan. Utan det var mer att någon skulle se att jag gör det så de inte tror att jag är en dålig människa. För att jag har ett annat utseende. Even now as an adult I'm still aware of how people might perceive me. I don't want to come across dangerous. If you're told that, you know, uh, you're just a worthless whatever, then over time, if you hear that many enough times, implicitly or explicitly, it's very easy to what we call internalize that. That becomes part of your own thinking. I thought I was substandard. I thought I wasn't as good or I'll never be as clever as a, um, as a white person. A little bit ashamed of myself. And that's that's terrible because you shouldn't be ashamed of the person you are or the heritage you have because you with that you create your own mindset that everything you do relating to maybe your heritage or culture is wrong. And if that repeats itself again and again somehow it's stuck in your head and then you start thinking about it and then I was like damn maybe they would like me more if I be a, of a lighter skin color or or white. Jag hade inte råd med det, men där på plats så tog jag en flaska blekmedel. Och sen så satte jag mig ner mellan hyllorna och drog det i mitt hår. Jag tänkte bara att nu ska jag bli som dem. Förstod inte liksom det djupare aspekten av det än att på måndag kommer det bli roligare att gå till skolan. Nästa vecka, medan jag har den här blonda fläcken så kan jag kanske vara en av dem tills dess, liksom, att det växer ut eller så. Det var så enkelt för mig och jag trodde att de såg mig med andra ögon bara för att de såg den här blonda fläcken här. För att jag trodde att jag såg mig själv med andra ögon. We looking at microaggressions, which is one of the most common and biggest microaggressions this term again is something that ca- it comes from the 70s very often it wasn't this one big 
harsh, horrible event racist thing. It was every day, common day, sort of sometimes intentional, sometimes unintentional um, microaggressions. Or even just simple things like if you want to go to the store and buy groceries and you're being followed by the employees, believing that I'm about to steal something. Having to walk into a room and being undermined by white males. Having to speak and constantly be questioned. It was never like that I was dumb in the head or that I was like... Other selves, but it came always to my appearance. It came always to that I was like... Mörka utseendet och, och hade ett konstigt namn och sådär. Like you've been stopped by the police for silly reasons, checking your ID, um, pulling you over while you're driving, immediately asking you um, what did you smoke or whatever, whatever. Immediately jumping to assumptions and um, you know, you have to deal with prejudices. Going into a restaurant with your white male partner and completely being ignored. All those microaggressions turn into an exhausting day at the end of the day. You know, one mosquito bite doesn't hurt, but when it's a lot of mosquito bites, it starts really hurting. And that's also then, you know, sort of, you, that's also an image to describe, I guess, the dynamic and effect of, of racism. When I was a kid, I, I grew up in, in a pretty, well-to-do suburban household, but uh, I lived in an alcoholic household, and and as I grew up, that antisocial behavior escalated. So by the time I'm 14, I'm drinking myself. By the time I'm 16, I'm a violent alcoholic, and that's what uh, made me ripe for the violent extremist ideology of white nationalism. The story I chose to believe back then was that this color of my skin made me different than everybody else and superior to everybody else and at war with everyone else. I was queuing up for a burger and some a crowd of white lads started shouting, give me the, the salute and shouting Zeke Heil at me and I thought, but I was fairly confident because I was a boxer, but it, it, it still weren't the most comfortable thing to go through. Yeah, there were Nazists outside of school that som you're making every beating that happens is like a, a battle in this greater war for the white race. Even though there, there's no like logical argument you could make for that. In Stockholm, every 13 November, so could like hundreds of Nazists march here, and this has touched me also very much. I have had. My photo put up on a Nazi website because I went to an anti-Nazi protest. And you start to read these comments and it's just like, yeah, they shouldn't be here anyway. Um, and how do you go to the cops about that? What do you say? I need to take it down. Then now you on the neo-Nazis alert. Fear was the the bread and butter of, and it remains, of, of white nationalism and, and honestly of any violent extremist ideology of any sort. But in white nationalism, uh, it's it's the fear of what's going to happen when they take over and they being people of color. It, it helped you to maintain a fear of all black people. And you had to have that fear in order to make white nationalist ideology make sense. And fear, again, turns to anger real quick. Frustration. <laughs> so it's an ever-going circle in some kind of way, you know? Well, first of all, with anger, when you are in a situation of oppression, if you are experiencing some sort of racism and you feel anger, I think it's important to recognize, first of all, that that is not wrong. I've been so angry, you know? I've, I've been so angry and I fought every time anybody said something about any racial, racial slur or whatever, I was ready to fight, always ready to fight. But I think it's incredibly important for us to recognize that anger is a very natural response. Anger and frustration, they are natural in a situation of oppression and they are intelligent emotions very often. They will, they will tell us that, pay attention, you know, something important is going on here. Your needs are not met. You know, you are not respected. Something is going on that needs attention. Yeah, it was the first time he called me a nigger. 
it at the first time, I didn't really know how to react. I didn't know if I should be angry or if we should step away. Like everybody talks about, you know, turning the other cheek. But at that point, I don't know, something, something was like, well, he shouldn't say this shit. And so I just stepped in and I, and I clocked him in the face. If you're not able to um, deal with that anger in the right way, at some point you're going to lash out. If you get it out in a way that's kind of, you know, screaming and violent, etc., it's going to injure yourself as well as the other person. If I'm screaming and yelling and being angry at you, my body and mind will still feel the effects of that and will still be very, you know, potentially damaged by that. Violence harms the perpetrator. Uh, yeah, I would never say it harms the perpetrator as much as the, as the victim or in the same way. But when you commit violence, it, it harms you. It, 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 uh, it destroys your ability to be at peace with yourself. It was just an unnecessary thing. There was, there was no need to be violent because he doesn't understand. We can very often th think that anger is a bad thing and you shouldn't feel anger. And then you can also very easily fit into the stereotype of the, I don't know, the, um, the angry, um, like, brown young man. Everyone was afraid of me. Everyone was afraid of me because I fought all the time. That actually followed me a lot, that people were afraid of me, that I would be angry. It's a difficult dynamic, this, because if, if a person does react with anger, that can, especially a brown or black woman, that will very often then just confirm a stereotype that the oppressors or, or people acting out of oppression will have, which is, oh my God, that woman, she's just out of control, you know, or that's so primitive, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you assert yourself, you're angry. You are, uh, you're too much, you're aggressive, you are everything else but yourself. Um, you are received as, whoa, you're a bit too much right now. Ignoring it or kind of pushing it away, I think is also a very common response though. And, you know, it's, um, that kind of dynamic is, um, is nurtured or, or kept alive by several factors. And I think one of them is that the good immigrant should not talk about racism. The good immigrant should not uh, make white people uncomfortable, you know? I always try to put myself in their shoes. What can I do to, to make them feel more comfortable? But at some point, why am I stressing myself to, to understand how they feel? Why can't they understand that I'm also just a person? Why can't you um, be more open, more tolerant or whatever? I think things are changing a lot now. Um, and I think one of the biggest changes, which I'm really, really happy about, is the fact that this is not just my problem anymore, you know? It's, it's your problem as a white person. I cannot be Google where I have to dissect white fragility anymore. I cannot be the one who has to explain to you my existence so you can understand because I have had to learn about my existence. I have had to learn about my history. I have had to unlearn and decolonize my own body, my own mind, and now having to now dissect and make sure that a white audience understand it's no longer my job. And I don't think it's people of color's job anymore to have to explain themselves. It's time for white people to do their job and to be allies by investigating it themselves. What really led me out of it was exhaustion. What was most exhausting was when people I claimed to hate treated me with kindness. My black or Latino coworkers would like share their lunches with me. And they, they, they'd be like, hey, skinhead, you hungry? You want part of the sandwich? Like they, they knew who I was, but they wouldn't let me sit there starving. I felt foolish. I felt like a hypocrite. Uh, I, I felt wrong. I, I felt like it, I, I was just completely full of shit. And that change is so important, I think, that we're all kind of taking some responsibility so it doesn't become this kind of polarized, like, um, polarized, like, conflict. No!
To be quite honest, I've been struggling a little bit because now you have all this uh, George Floyd and uh, Black Lives Movement and all these things that are hap happening. And I'm a little bit tired. I've been fighting for so long. So many of our people have died to prove that we are exactly equal. And we still have to deal with this shit. And in Scandinavia, still, we should be better as a people. I'm so tired because you've seen it so, so many times and it's been hit in your face so many, so many times that you're kind of losing hope in some way. I've realized with myself, for example, over these past weeks that I haven't engaged much. And I haven't judged, judged myself too much for it either. I've been like, it's great that there is a big mobilization happening right now. That's great. But I could just be like, oh, I, I don't want to go into this stuff again. I don't want to do that. And I could be like, okay, you know what? You don't have to. It comes back because even though, even though you overcome stuff, you never really forget it. It's still something, it's some, somewhere in your mind. And, and the shit kind of comes back to you and you, you relive it in your mind. You think about it. You think about all the other you know, situations you've been in. And there, there are things that you gladly want to forget. You know, it takes its toll to, to have these experiences and then also to talk about it because how much do you want to talk about it and have it define you and, and, and go into all of this stuff again and again and again. I realized lately that the white people in my life are allies and they work at their allyship. And I'm very grateful for that because then I can take a back seat and then I can exist and we can have conversations about other things than me trying to explain. I think um, having a community, feeling safe, exploring these issues are also, that's also very, very important because it can really, it's, it can be a very stressful issue to, to deal with by yourself. Find yourself a community of black women. That's what I've done. Find black women who can cry with you, where you don't have to explain yourself, where you can be, because those are spaces where you can exist. First of all, you need to talk to somebody. You need to talk to somebody. If it's a friend, if it's your parents, if a random fucking stranger on the streets, you know, try to talk to somebody. And if they listen, they listen. If they don't, they don't listen. But sometimes you just need to get things out. You need to share those stories with somebody. Don't, don't keep it inside and until it really explodes and you don't you do not want to be in this type of situation i would say i know that you're angry i understand that you're angry but you have a choice in your own life to actually take that anger and that anxiety or whatever you have in your life and use it to something else what really helped me was when i discovered my passion for dance i had a way to express my emotions so I didn't have to deal with it um, in a way where I just end up being frustrated and angry at the world. If you're angry, you can also write things down, write poems, you don't need to share them. It doesn't mean that you have to be a performing artist that has to, you can write it down for your own self. If you're in a situation where you hate a group of people, I challenge you to go and sit down and have a conversation with someone from that group and talk to them about what you've been through and ask them what they've been through and, and ask them about their hopes and their dreams and their challenges. And I, I'm very confident that you'll find out you have much more in common than, with them than different. The best thing I've learned from myself as or growing up is that, you know, be different. Be strong in being different. As somebody different, it makes you that little bit special and it can give you more as many adva advantages as it gives you dis disadvantages. First of all, embracing who you are and where you are coming from. Learn about your culture, learn about what makes you special. Be happy with who you are. Accept your identity, accept your heritage. We have over a billion people on this planet. And even though we have points in our lives where we feel like we are alone and 
you think about this shit is only happening to me. It's not. It's happening to a lot of people, probably at the same time, different ages, different cultures. You are not alone. There is a community of black women, of women of color, who all have your experiences. It might not be word for word or account for account, but you know that when you sit down with another person of color, when you sit down with another black woman and tell your story, they know exactly what you're talking about. My best advice is patience. Because sooner or later, you will find people that has gone through the same stuff but only if you let them in. Only if you open yourself up enough to hear other stories. And when you hear these other stories, that's when you're gonna move. That's when you're gonna be able to grow. Because we're always stronger together. So have patience. <laughs>